Worldwide, we're looking at approximately 350 million people with diabetes. There's no question that we're in the midst of a diabetes epidemic. Right now, one in three Medicare dollars is spent in the care of people with diabetes. One in 10 total health care dollars is spent with diabetes. There's no question that this is a major problem. What in particular is the correlation with the diet and diabetes? I'm, I'm not going to get into that. Into diet? No. My name's Kip. I'm a filmmaker from San Francisco and I have a confession to make. I'm a recovering hypochondriac. Like so many of us, I have a family history of diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. My dad had his first heart bypass at 49, his second at age 50. My grandpa died young from diabetes complications and both my other grandpa and grandma died of cancer. I was always paranoid that I would also get one of these diseases. Like any good hypochondriac, WebMD Symptoms Checker was essentially my browser's homepage. Even in my teens, I took Metamucil every day and a daily aspirin. I read all the latest self-diagnosis books, I ate every multivitamin I could get my hands on, and I was obsessed with bodily functions. I followed all the large health organizations' recommendations for preventing disease. I exercise regularly, don't smoke, don't drink soda, get enough sleep, reduce stress, and grew up eating what I thought was a healthy diet. Until... World Health Organization this morning has classified processed meat such as bacon and sausage as carcinogenic, directly involved in causing cancer in humans. Processed meat is clearly linked to an increase in cancer. Hot dogs or bacon could be just as dangerous as smoking cigarettes. The World Health Organization had looked at over 800 studies from 10 different countries, finding a direct link to consuming processed meat and cancer. Just one serving of deli meats daily increases your risks of colorectal cancer by 18%. I had no idea that what we ate affected cancer rates, but I never felt like I had eaten a lot of processed meats until I realized that processed meat includes hot dogs, bacon, sausage, salami, ham, pepperoni, cold cuts, and deli slices, basically everything I grew up eating. The World Health Organization classifies processed meat as a group one carcinogen the same group as cigarettes, asbestos, and plutonium, and classifies red meat as a group two carcinogen. Was this like I had essentially been smoking my entire childhood? If processed meats are labeled the same as cigarettes, how is it even legal for kids to be eating this way? I thought this was new information, but many of these studies have been around for 50 years. I couldn't believe I'd been eating processed meats virtually my entire life and was just now finding out how dangerous they are. Why hadn't I been hearing about it from the American Cancer Society, the largest cancer group in the nation? When I went on their website, I was shocked to see that none of this information was featured on their homepage. But even more shocking, on their Eat Healthy page, they actually encouraged eating Group 1 carcinogenic foods like processed turkey and canned meats. This is after the World Health Organization reviewed over 800 studies definitively linking processed meat to cancer. Thank you for calling your American Cancer Society. My name is Sam. I'm a cancer information specialist. How may I help you today? Hi, I was calling because I was wondering why you all recommend people to eat processed meat on your website, which the World Health Organization has classified as a Group 1 carcinogen, which is in the same class as tobacco smoking, asbestos, and plutonium. This would be like a lung association having a how to roll your own cigarette section on their website. It's kind of the same thing. But let me just take you on a brief hold because, um... He wasn't able to answer my questions and said someone would get back with me. 
I had always been concerned about cancer because both my grandma and grandpa died of cancer. I wondered if things would have been different had they known the link between diet and this terrible disease. In the U.S., one out of every four deaths is from cancer. Oh, sweet. American Cancer Society rep confirmed an interview this week. So we just went in for the interview with the American Cancer Society rep, and the security guard said there's no interview scheduled. So I went into my phone, and it turns out last night, after I told her that the interview is going to be about the correlation between diet and cancer, she said she could no longer do the interview. After repeated emails asking why she was declining my interview to simply talk about diet and cancer, she stopped responding altogether. Why would an American Cancer Society rep not want to talk about this? I was, however, able to connect with a growing movement of doctors who are willing to talk about the link between the standard American diet and disease, and it goes beyond just cancer. I took my old trusty van, Super Blue, once again out on the road. Two-thirds of adults are now overweight or obese, and we have an epidemic cascade of debilitating disease that's overcoming the country. There's no way we can sustain the current style of care with the epidemic that we're creating with our diet and lifestyle choices. The diabetes, the arthritis, the heart disease, the dementia, the obesity, the cancers are affecting about 70% of deaths. All the data is that those 70% of deaths and morbidity are largely lifestyle-related most kids by age 10 in the U.S. already have fatty streaks in their arteries, the first stage of atherosclerosis leading to heart attacks, strokes. Here in American Medicine, we operate from the disease model. We are in the business of treating sick people. We are not in the business of trying to prevent people from becoming sick. When you look at chronic disease risk, all the things that we walk around worrying about, actually dietary choices trump smoking when it comes to those risks. If I could deliver one message to the researchers who are looking for the cause of diabetes and the cause of clogged arteries and the cause of high blood pressure and the cause of obesity, I would tell them the answer is in three words. It's the food. <laughs> it's what, what Americans are eating. Today, with two-thirds of Americans being overweight, clearly there's a food issue. In the next 25 years, one out of every three Americans will have diabetes. My name's Michael Abdallah. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, and unfortunately, I was diagnosed about 10 years ago with diabetes, and eight years ago, I had two stents put in. I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. You're just like out of options, and, and you don't know what to do. You're taking medicine. You're listening to this doctor, and the cardiologist says, hey, take this, and the, and the uh, endocrinologist says, take that. Then your general practitioner doctor says, you don't know what's going on here, and it's a, it's a real it's a real challenging thing, and it's something that you don't want to get. You just don't want to get it. Government and media almost exclusively blame lack of exercise and sugary foods as a cause of diabetes. But I wanted to talk with an actual expert on the role of diet and diabetes. I went to speak with premier physician, diabetes expert, and researcher, Dr. Neil Barnard. What role does sugar play in causing diabetes? <sighs> Drive me crazy. Diabetes is not and never was caused by eating a high-carbohydrate diet, and it's not caused by eating sugar. The cause of diabetes is a diet that builds up the amount of fat into the blood. I'm talking about a typical meat-based, animal-based diet. You can look into the muscle cells of the human body, and you find that they're building up tiny particles of fat. It's causing insulin resistance. What that means is the sugar that is naturally from the foods that you're eating can't get into the cells where it belongs. It builds up in the blood, and that's diabetes. I had never heard that meat was associated with causing diabetes. We had always been told that sugar and obesity caused it. Renowned weight loss bariatric surgeon Dr. Garth Davis, though, agreed. Everyone thinks that you get diabetic because of carbs. They did a huge study in that epic study, 500,000 people. Carbs consumption was inversely related to diabetes. In other words, the more carbs someone ate, the less diabetes they had. But meat was strongly correlated. To get that aha moment. The starches, the carbs are good for you. They're not bad for you. This idea that carbs make you fat is utterly ridiculous. Carbs cannot make you fat in and of themselves. We have storage in our muscles and in our liver for carbs called glycogen. So when we eat carbs, we either store it or we burn it. Now, eat fat, that goes straight to your fat. Your body can't turn those carbs into fat unless you're really overdoing it. 
calories. Now, basically, it's a death sentence. You are at much higher risk of getting cancer. You're almost certainly going to get diabetes. I mean, no one wants to fat shame, and we all want everybody to be comfortable with our bodies, but this movement to be comfortable with our bodies has made us comfortable with being sick, and that's a huge problem. I go into the hospital, and I look around me, people on dialysis, all these sick people, and just about every disease in there is because of what people are eating. Here's the thing. If I eat a sugary cookie, the sugar lures you in like the Trojan horse, but waiting inside that cookie is a huge load of butter or shortening, and that's what fattens you up, and that's the part that leads to the diabetes. It's the fatty foods, not really so much the sugar. It's not that sugar is good for you. There's no nutrients in it. It's excess calories, but when you eat sugar, you don't get inflammation right away. When you eat sugar, you're not getting plaques forming in your vessels. When you're eating sugar, your body's going to store most of it as glycogen or burn it as calories. And so this focus on sugar has taken all the focus off meat, dairy, eggs, pork, turkey, chicken. People need to understand. You know, if their child gets diabetes, you've just taken 19 years off their lifespan. We're talking life and death. I realized there was so much more about diet and disease that I hadn't ever learned. It felt as if this information had been practically withheld. Processed meat causes cancer. Sugar doesn't cause diabetes. I had doubt about the claims these doctors were making, so I did some searching on my own. Harvard researchers looked at nine prospective studies finding that just one serving of processed meat per day increased risk of developing diabetes by 51%. The link between eating meat and developing diabetes became undeniable. But when I went on the leading diabetes organization's website, the American Diabetes Association, not only did they not have this information front and center, they were featuring recipes for red and processed meat. And on their recipes for healthy living, they had bacon-wrapped shrimp? What the hell? All right, send an email to the American Diabetes Association, see if they'll go back to us. As destructive as diabetes is, it pales in comparison to heart disease. Over 17 million people die every year from cardiovascular disease. It is the leading cause of death around the world. Nearly one out of every three people will die from this disease. The amount of people who die from cardiovascular disease is the equivalent of four jumbo jets crashing every single hour, every single day, every single year. My name is Amy Resnick, and I'm from Swampscott, Massachusetts, a little bit north of Boston. And I recently went to my doctor for asthma because I had a very hard time breathing. And while there, she did some blood work, and um, one of the tests was um, C-reactive protein. And on a scale from, there was a scale of one to three, one being low for cardiac event, three being high for cardiac event. And my number was 10.8. Too. What does that mean? That means I am on the road for a heart attack, and she said probably within the next 30 days. 30 days? 30 days, if I'm going the way I was going. I take um, this for my heart arrhythmia, um, take this for pain, uh, oxycodone for pain, and lorazepam for stress, uh, cyclobenzaprine for a muscle relaxer, also take Topamax and Prozac. And I also use a CPAP machine to help me breathe. And my asthma has been so bad um, this past year, I use it during the day as well um, to get some air. I am tired when I wake up. I'm tired during the day. I take a nap. I'm still tired. I can't breathe. Um, and I know I need to make a change for my health or else I'm not going to be here for my family. When we speak of heart disease, I would say the role of alcohol is pretty small. The role of sugar is very small, too. Smoking is big, but the good news is that most people have quit or, or never did smoke. The problem with animal-based diet, its contribution to heart disease is huge, and it is pervasive. All this expensive imaging, procedures, bypasses, medication, none of which has one solitary single thing to do with the causation of the illness. So you die of a completely benign, foodborne illness that never had its causation treated. When we eat these kind of 
dead meat bacterial toxins within minutes. You get this burst of inflammation within your system such that you basically paralyze your arteries. You get this stiffening of the arteries, their inability to relax normally in half. So it's not like decades down the road eating unhealthy, there'll be some damage. No, we're talking damage right then and there within minutes of it going into our mouth. Many people are given the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease when it's not true Alzheimer's at all. The vast majority of people suffer dementia due to their tiny blood vessels in their brain clogging up and their nerve cells being shortchanged of oxygenated blood. And guess where that blood vessel dementia comes from? Those little tiny arteries are clogging up from that steady stream of fat, cholesterol, etc. It's really quite clear from the standpoint of cancer and the standpoint of cardiovascular disease that animal protein plays an enormous role. Is chicken better? It's a question of whether you want to be shot or hung. The flesh food that I would eliminate from the American diet would be poultry, would be turkey and chicken. A brilliant advertising campaign has convinced people that, oh, it's white meat, it's healthier. The leading source of sodium in the American diet for adult is chicken. It can be labeled all natural chicken, but being injected with the salt water, I think up to 800 milligrams of sodium. Heterocyclic amines are clear-cut carcinogens, and they can form in any kind of meat as it's heated, as it's cooked. But by far the biggest source is chicken. We sent researchers into fast food and family restaurants. Not only were there carcinogens in every single restaurant, but we found them in every single chicken sample that we took. If somebody brings their family in and they're buying a bucket of chicken, nobody tells them that there are carcinogens. If you're selling carcinogens to people, you've got to warn them that they're in there. But the American Cancer Society encourages people to switch from red and processed meat to chicken. Why would the American Cancer Society tell people to switch from eating one carcinogenic food to another when a Harvard University study showed that men with prostate cancer who eat large amounts of chicken increase their risk of the disease progressing four times? The number one dietary source in America of cholesterol is chicken because of the volume of chicken. You know, chickens become grilled chicken and organic chicken. It's, it's machismo, but it has nearly as much cholesterol per gram as red beef. So just on sheer volume, it's the number one source. You know, eggs being close behind. I never really thought about eggs much. I just thought of them as a standard part of a healthy diet. But then I found a study suggesting that eating just one egg a day can be as bad as smoking five cigarettes per day for life expectancy. The yolk of a hen's egg is the most concentrated glom of saturated fat and cholesterol. It is made to run a bait and chicken for 21 days with no outside energy. It is pure fat and cholesterol. And when we put that into our bloodstream, it coats our red blood cells. Our blood gets thicker and more viscous. It changes our hormone levels. It raises our cholesterol levels. There's nothing healthy about eating the yolk of the egg. But I thought cholesterol and saturated fat wasn't an issue anymore. You know, these saturated fat studies that have come out trying to vindicate saturated fat, there's a campaign by the dairy industry, right? Number one source of saturated fat is dairy. It's not meat. 2008, the global dairy industry got together at a meeting and explicitly, you read their agenda, was to neutralize the negative impact of milk fat by regulators and medical professionals, unquote. So they do, they funded studies. The main study that started the whole saturated fat media craze was funded by the National Dairy Council. The egg industry similarly funds studies that confuse consumers by making claims that eggs don't negatively affect heart function. That is, only when compared to eating a McDonald's sausage McMuffin? So what they're really saying is that eating eggs is just as bad as eating a McMuffin. When you eat foods like beef or steak or a processed meat, a hot dog, you're not just getting saturated fat. You're also getting other additional toxins that are in that food. There's heme iron, carcinogens, processing chemicals. This is all a lot more complicated than just looking at saturated fat. You know, the strategy is not on making your products any safer. The strategy is to just try to confuse the public, to introduce doubt. You know, there's a famous tobacco industry memo. It's called Doubt is Our Product. That's all they had to do. They didn't have to convince Americans that smoking was healthy. They just had to introduce doubt. Then they would win. If there's just enough controversy, people kind of throw up their hands. I don't know what to eat. Confusion is their game. I really don't think people thought what they ate led to heart disease. They think, oh, it's genetic. My parents had it. I don't think people really think that what they ate led to diabetes. I think, oh, my parents had it. I was going to get it. And certainly cancer may have done that. 
People have bad lifestyles that they've inherited environmentally. They've been exposed to a certain way of eating and living that they've carried on into their adulthood, passed on to their children. That is why they go on to develop the same diseases that their parents and grandparents may have had before them. But it is not inevitable. Even if you have a genetic predisposition, it doesn't mean it's going to necessarily manifest. And what determines whether it manifests or not may be those epigenetic variables, the things that you can control, the environmental factors, the dietary factors, the lifestyle factors. So we can actually change the expression of genes, tumor suppressing genes, tumor activating genes, by what we eat, what we put into our body. So you know, even if you've been dealt a bad genetic deck, you can still reshuffle it with diet. I had always thought that I would develop heart disease at a young age because both my dad and grandpa had heart attacks. I was taught that they were genetic, but their heart attacks probably had less to do with genes and more to do with their diets high in meat. That's why when I went on the American Heart Association's Heart Healthy Recipes page, I could not believe they had an entire section on beef recipes. This was just like the American Cancer Society encouraging eating group one carcinogens on their site. Meatloaf pork loin, steak, on your recipe list? Are you kidding me? It's like this menu is trying to give people heart attacks. Here at your website, we notice heart healthy recipes, and we were uh, kind of bewildered by why there was a bunch of recipes on, a whole section on beef, beef recipes, and there's also a section on egg recipes when there's such a strong link between beef, red meat, and heart disease. Another organization rep that wasn't able to answer my questions, but he said that he'd have someone get in touch shortly. I was, however, able to talk to the president of the American College of Cardiology, Dr. Kim Williams. Well, the American College of Cardiology is a 47,000 member and growing uh, organization with a dedicated mission to reduce heart disease and to improve patients' lives. And if you look at the incidence of hypertension and diabetes uh, and mortality in men, they, they actually get reduced as you uh, go higher and higher in terms of how much you restrict animal products. What about fish? So fish is a little different. You've got the four worries, which is PCBs, mercury, um, uh, saturated fat, and cholesterol. And the cholesterol is all over the place. You can hit tuna in water, that would be almost less than a glass of milk, to salmon or tilapia, which is higher than a pork chop. If you look objectively at fish, what you find is they've become essentially mercury sponges. And that's why in many parts of the country they warn you, you know, don't have more than so many of these fish a week because it's getting too much mercury can kill you. Fish are eaten by bigger fish who are eaten by bigger fish, and these pesticides and herbicides bioaccumulate in the fish flesh. And these big fish, including the salmon, which people think is the healthiest fish, truth is the amount of pesticides and herbicides in the flesh of these fish are shocking, and they have estrogenic and cancer-promoting properties in them. They'll say, well, but don't sardines have less concentration of toxic waste product than other ones? Something being less toxic doesn't make it healthy. It just makes it less toxic. Farmed fish is by no means healthier. All the antibiotics that these animals have to be fed, similar to chickens and turkeys kept in confinement, these fish get infections. They get fungal infections. They get bacterial infections. You've got to feed them antifungals, antibiotics, and these substances accumulate in the fish flesh as well. I always knew that pollution was bad for our health, but I had never thought about the environmental pollutants affecting food. Dioxins, being the most toxic man-made chemicals known to science, cause all sorts of things. They cause endometriosis, they cause cancers, they cause endocrine disruption problems. And most of your exposure, 93% of it, comes from eating meat and dairy products because it climbs up in the food chain so effectively. So you can get exposed to living near these incinerators and breathing it, but it'll take you 14 years to breathe in as much dioxin as a cow will ingest by eating the grass in one day. And that dioxin will accumulate in its fat, which includes the milk and the meat. And anyone eating meat or dairy products is going to get that dose of dioxin, so it climbs up the food chain every step. Men have no way in their bodies to get rid of dioxins, but women have two ways. They're both involving having a baby. One is that dioxin crosses the placenta into the growing infant, and the other is that it comes out from the breast milk. So if you have a meat and dairy consuming mother breastfeeding that infant, then the highest impacts of toxic exposure like mercury and dioxins will go to that infant. Pregnant women are told those certain types of fish should be avoided. But what about all these other 
animal products which are introducing, imagine as the fetus is developing, introducing these very harmful toxins which create reproductive abnormalities, developmental problems and hormonal issues right as the child is developing, the most critical stage of development. It does make you worry when people say, don't you want to have a little bit of milk because you're pregnant? Don't you want to have some fish because you're pregnant? Who do you think is going to get the chemicals that are in that? All these environmental toxins and toxins from the feed that they're being fed accumulate in their tissues and are released into the mother and unfortunately to the child when you eat these products when you're pregnant. So this includes antibiotics, hormones, steroids in animal feed. Commercial animals are largely fed GMO corn and soy which are very laden in pesticides. PCBs have been banned since the 70s, but they persist in the environment. Dioxins, all of these compounds can create hormonal, reproductive, developmental damage as well. Eating organic beef, poultry, pork, or fish will not help you avoid contaminants like mercury, like dioxins, like strontium-90, because they fall out over all sorts of farm fields and water bodies, and they don't skip over the organic fields. So really, the contaminants are coming in regardless of how these animals are raised. I had always been concerned about the possible health impacts of GMOs, but then found out that most of the world's GMO crops are actually consumed by livestock, with dairy cows consuming the most per animal. This fact, with everything I'd learned about bioaccumulation, made dairy terrifying, especially considering how much cheese I ate in my life. Cheese is an amazing product when you think about it. It's probably one of the single best foods at compromising health that you're going to actually feed the people. Think about it. You've got an animal product, so you've got all the issues of biological concentration. You have a highly processed food product, and not only does it have naturally a lot of saturated fat, but you put a lot of salt into it. There's a strong link between dairy foods and autoimmune diseases, and so that can show itself up as excessive production of mucus and exacerbation of asthma in kids who are prone to that, and even adults. And also there's an association between dairy foods and multiple sclerosis and type 1 diabetes, which is an autoimmune disease, and other uh, rheumatologic problems. Cow's milk is baby calf growth food. That's what this stuff is. There's absolutely no child or human on earth who actually needs the milk of a cow any more than they need the milk of a giraffe or a mouse. Most people in the world are lactose intolerant. I mean, that's the normal state of affairs. Why would your body create this enzyme to digest lactose after weaning, after infancy? It doesn't make any sense. 73% of African Americans are lactose intolerant. 95% uh, of Asians, uh, roughly 70% of Native Americans, and about 53% of uh, Hispanic Americans are lactose intolerant. Our government is encouraging Americans of color to eat foods that it knows is going to make them ill. Ultimately, what that boils down to is the government is telling me as an African American to eat food that's going to make me ill for no health benefit so that it will benefit uh, dairy farmers as a form of institutionalized racism. Yeah, milk is a risky uh, food for human consumption. As a pediatrician, I see on a daily basis children suffering from conditions that are linked or associated to dairy consumption, such as eczema, acne, constipation, acid reflux, iron deficiency, anemia. Cow's milk protein is the most allergenic food. People say, well, no, I want hormone-free, not injected with bovine growth hormone. But milk is this hormonal fluid, so it's just packed with sex hormones or natural sex steroid hormones like estrogen, progesterone. In fact, doesn't matter if it's conventional milk, doesn't matter if it's organic milk. Milk without hormones, that's an oxymoron. Organic dairy has just as much saturated fat and cholesterol and galactose and all the things that you don't want as conventional dairy. Dairy products in general have a lot of other products associated with it, not the least of which is pus. I mean, they actually have laws limiting how much pus you can actually have in a milk and still sell it. I believe it's like 750,000 pus cells per cc. Because, I mean, you wouldn't want too much pus. It would be like pure pus. People might object. In fact, you could think of cheese as kind of coagulated cow pus, if you will. But I was always told that we need milk for strong bones. I'm Jane Chapman, and not too long ago, finally got some x-rays of the hips and back. Severe bilateral osteoarthritis of the hips. And actually, I'm scheduled for two hip replacements. That's bone on bone. It's the grinding of the joints. My stability is scary. I hold on to the walls if I'm at home. I've been told to use a walker 
I'm only 61. This is not how you're supposed to live when you're this old. I have a really hard time believing that um, that's all that's left. Researchers have studied bone development in kids and whether they get stress fractures and that kind of thing. And the kids who drink the most milk have zero protection. Milk does not build strong bones. Harvard researchers have looked at a large group of older women. Over an 18-year period, the milk drinkers had zero protection from fractures. So this old notion that somehow milk is going to build strong bones or protect your bones later in life, it's a myth. People that drink milk have higher rates of hip fractures, have more cancer, and live shorter lives. Turns out that countries with the highest dairy consumption also have the highest rates of osteoporosis. So clearly, drinking more milk doesn't protect your bones. Doing more research, I found that dairy was linked to many different types of cancer as well. Just like many of us, I thought that the majority of cancer was due to genes, but only 5 to 10% of cancer is actually genetic. Any cancer is caused by a DNA mutation, but that's not enough. So that can cause that first cancer cell, but one cancer cell never killed anyone. Two cancer cells never killed anyone. But a billion cancer cells, now we're running into problems. So we need to reduce the growth factors in our body, like IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1. is this cancer-promoting growth hormone involved in every stage of cancer cell growth and spread and metastases. Any animal protein boosts the level of IGF-1. Dairy products increases your risk for various forms of cancer, especially those related to your hormones. So breast cancer, prostate cancer, ovarian cancer. So this is not a product even in its most pure state you want to be consuming because it does come with risk. I found out that dairy can increase a man's chance of getting prostate cancer by 34%. And for women who've had breast cancer, just one serving of whole dairy a day can increase their chance of dying from the disease 49% and dying from anything 64%. Why weren't breast cancer sites like Susan G. Komen warning everyone about this? Susan G. Komen, this is Johnson. How may I help you? Okay, so we're wondering why you don't have a huge warning about the dangers of consuming dairy on your website when there's a direct link to breast cancer. There was a study published in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute that found out women consuming dairy who has had breast cancer increases their risk of dying of breast cancer 49%. I was wondering why it's not on your website. We cannot answer these types of questions. Once again, another health organization rep saying someone else would have to answer my question. Rather than risk being stood up again, I went straight to the local Susan G. Komen chapter to see if they would answer my questions. They didn't want to answer my questions in person either and told us to stop filming, but promised they would connect me to the national office directly. Susan G. Komen's Pink Ribbon campaign had done a lot to raise awareness for breast cancer. Although, it was confusing to see pink ribbons on dairy yogurt containers. Breast cancer can be prevented with a healthy diet and lifestyle, but we're not. We're talking about pink ribbons and putting all the money into research for the cure. I, for one, know that I would want my daughter, my mother, me, I want to focus on not getting to that point, and that's where I would like to see more energy and effort. I had been a hardcore cheeseaholic virtually my entire life, despite the risks, but like so many others, I seem to have been addicted to it. It turns out that the casein protein, that's the main protein in dairy products, and particularly cheese, it breaks apart in the human digestion to create what are called casomorphins, casein-derived morphine-like compounds that go to the brain and they attach to the very same receptor that heroin attaches to. Don't get me wrong. They're not as strong as that, but they are strong enough to make you come back again and again and again, despite the fact that you're gaining weight, you're more unhealthy than you've ever been, but that cheese just calls out to people. Casomorphin uh, may play a role in SIDS and sudden infant death syndrome, may play a role in autism. This is one of the reasons why we don't want infants drinking milk from cows. Human breast milk has 2.7 grams of casein per liter, compared to 26 grams per liter for cow's milk. That's practically 10 times more. No wonder it's so addictive. This talk about addiction made me think about all the drugs animals are fed. I went to the headquarters of the Center for Food and Safety, the nation's leading FDA government watchdog group, to see how concerned we need to be about drugs in our food. So that we know of, there are at least 450 different drugs that are administered to animals, either alone or in combination. 
these drugs are given to animals for a variety of reasons, very, very few of which are actually beneficial to consumer health. We've got drug companies that work real hard to make sure they can sell lots of drugs to people raising cows, pigs, and chickens. The pharmaceutical industry sells 80% of all the antibiotics that it makes in the United States to animal agriculture. Antibiotic residues are found in meat. Other antimicrobials are found in meat. There has been arachnopamine found in meat. There's been hormones found in meat. So right there, you're talking about four different drugs. It could be in, you know, in the same piece of meat. The pharmaceutical company is supposed to show the safety of animal drugs. They're not really testing to see what the impacts of these drugs are on humans. They're really looking to see what the impacts of these drugs are on animals. You know, when we try to get information on, on some of the health studies and the environmental studies from federal agencies, we get back page after page of blacked out information because the company claim confidential business information. Consumers have no idea what is in the products that they consume. So how sick something makes me and how bad it pollutes the environment is a secret for a company. In the animal agriculture industry, as in the tobacco industry, these companies really have a vested interest in making sure that the public doesn't have information about their effects and what risks are really posed to consuming them have this system where animals are living in their own waste, they're living next to animals that are sick or even dead, and they're stuck in cages with these animals, that bacteria tends to spread, so that the pathogens that are being created in these filthy conditions are breeding resistance to antibiotics, and the public are becoming exposed to those. We already have people dying from salmonella and other things that you eat. We have about 3,000 people die every year in the United States. That's more than the number of people that were killed in 9-11 in the Twin Towers in New York. If we had some terrorist organization killing 3,000 people a year, we would be all over it. The antibiotic-resistant bacteria deaths that we have, on top of that, you get 20,000 people dying a year. That's seven 9-11s every year. Can you imagine if that many people were being killed by some terrorist group in the United States every year? We would find them. You know, the World Health Organization has said we're nearing a post-antibiotic era in medicine. You'll be at risk in minor surgery to have a fatal infection. You'll be at risk going to the dentist if you have a tooth extracted. Or it'll be like Civil War medicine. You get an infection in your leg and you cut your leg off. So you have this very dangerous situation. By crowding these animals in, they become a perfect engine for generating a new slew virus that can come out into the community. If you live near a swine spray field, not even the CAFO, but the waste disposal field, you are three times more likely to have a MRSA infection. You can't see how it impacts the average person's life in Duplin County, North Carolina, and not be a little upset about it. From an environmental standpoint, from a community standpoint, from all other aspects, North Carolina, we're in, a, we're in a state of emergency. We've already had bouts of swine flu, or H1N1, as they prefer to refer to it. That particular swine flu incident was uh, originated on a farm here in North Carolina. There's approximately the same number of hogs in North Carolina as there are people. Between eight to ten times the amount of feces is produced by a hog, an adult hog, as compared to an adult human. 10 million pigs in North Carolina produce the waste equal to 100 million humans. This is the equivalent of the entire U.S. eastern seaboard flushing their toilets in the North Carolina. But there is no waste treatment. The pig's waste falls through slats in the floors of the sheds they are forced to live in. It is then pumped into giant waste pits, which leach into rivers and streams, and is pumped out unfiltered onto fields, further polluting the environment and neighboring health. When you go back and you look at where these hog facilities are located, there's a disproportionate number of them that are located near communities of color, low-income communities. It is definitely a human rights issue. My sister, she have asthma, and you know, her brother, he have asthma. He's three, and we don't know what she might have. I have asthma, I have sinus, I have sarcoidosis, that's of the bacteria, and I have a pacemaker, which is sick sinus syndrome. Uh, you know, mostly everybody in this neighborhood got asthma or either cancer. My neighbor there died from cancer probably just last year. My nephew down the street, he's got cancer. He's in terminal cancer, stage four. 
not a smoker, not a drinker. And it's not in his lungs. It's in his left nose. But see, if you live here and saw the way they do, you wouldn't eat no pork. Well, I don't eat bacon because I know where it comes from. When they die, they go into a box and they decompose because they swell from stretch from heat. A truck come and pick them up, take them to the processing plant in Rose Hill, round them up into feet, and feed it back to the hogs. If I come out this door, if he's spraying there, it's going to come in my face. It hits you right in the face. It smells like something that you have never smelled before. It smells worse than a dead body. It's the family graveyard. I have my grandmother out there, my sisters, my brothers. When we go to the funeral, he used to spray. During the funeral? During the funeral, yes. During the funeral. Yeah, he spray. And when the people come, Everybody be closing their nose up, saying how it stinks. They can want to have a cookout on Sunday. He'll spray. Do you think he does it on purpose? I think so. Because he just sprays Sunday. He always sprays Sunday. And in most of these area, hog houses and turkey house, is in the black area or the Hispanic area. It's either or. Do you think it's also a civil rights issue? Yes. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. There have been times in the past that I have gotten ready on the Sunday, uh, to gotten ready to go to church and come out, and the smell was so strong that I had to go back and regroup because it got in my clothes, and I just couldn't go to church smelling like hogs, you know. I just couldn't do it. So I don't think the, the government cares. They care more about cooperation than do people, individuals. And they're going to keep on, they're going to put more chickens in this state. This is the feast season. You're in capital of the world right here in North Carolina. My state. Look, there's a blue line stream right here comes into my property almost. And the Contentney Creek right here. I've seen that blue line stream now filled with feces and urine from that hog pen. And they can say, well, we feed the world. They're not interested in feeding the world. They're interested in making money. You take the money away from them, they'll let the folks starve. Because if you want to feed the world, you can feed the world with more corn, using corn and wheat and stuff like that, and you can meat. Meat is a luxury item. When we're doing things that hurt other people, we're wrong. But a lot of good people will sit there and eat bacon knowing that it's causing someone else to be very unhappy. I woke up the next morning to find the Burden River had experienced another massive fish kill from the pollution running off hog farms. Tens of thousands of fish were washing up on shore. All this talk about health, I realized that I was only focused on personal health. But health started to mean so much more to me. It was about health of my family and our communities. I couldn't under good conscience support an industry that I knew was harming others. Pollution from animal agriculture isn't just an issue in North Carolina, though. Raising animals for food produces more greenhouse gases than the entire transportation sector. It is a leading cause of rainforest destruction, species extinction, ocean dead zones, and freshwater consumption. American Diabetes Association actually finally got back, and they agreed to an interview. Preparing for the American Diabetes Association interview, I took a look at their diabetes diet meal plan recommendations, and they were loaded with foods associated with causing diabetes. How could they expect people not to get diabetes if this was the food they were recommending? And then, I saw multiple peer-reviewed studies published on the National Institute of Health website showing that a low-fat, plant-based diet was more than twice as powerful at controlling and even reversing diabetes than the ADA-recommended diet that included meat and dairy. Well, the mission of the American Diabetes Association is to identify a prevention and a cure for diabetes, but in the meantime, to improve the lives of all people who are affected by diabetes. And uh, what's the best way to prevent, to prevent this? For type 2 diabetes, it's unclear. We can't prevent type 2 diabetes in everybody. When we were doing the research, we came across a lot of studies that said um, that you actually could potentially cure or reverse diabetes with a purely plant-based diet. I don't believe there's sufficient evidence to demonstrate that. 
How does it compare to the ADA diet that you recommend? We don't recommend a specific diet. We recommend we recommend healthy eating. The one that's on the website. We recommend healthy eating. There is. Do you have a whole? uh, You have a whole list of exact day to day the meal plan, the whole meal plan. All they are are selections of foods to consider. We do not have a diet diabetes diet. But with with that selections that you consider that that plan compared to a whole plant-based plan? No one's done that study. We found actually some studies, that a 74-week study found that low-fat vegan diet versus the ADA plan in type two. I think we're done here. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get into an argument about Oh no, I just wanted the studies of, uh, the studies of, the, if, if, if this is true or if it shows that of. Any diet works. Any diet works if people follow it. But if it's a diet that's not the proper diet, like if anyone follows a diet that they eat, I can't. Follow. I can't tell you what a proper diet is. I can tell you what an improper diet is. So then we can talk about the good diets. I'm not sure why. I'm. I'm not going to get into that. Into diet? No. Well, if, if, if that's if that's where you want to go with this, I'm sorry. I'm not the person that you should be talking to. And why is that, though? If that's what you want to get into, I'm not the person you need to be diet? talking to. Who do we talk to about diet? You can talk to anybody you want. But that's interesting, though. Why not recommend a diet? Because the stuff? data don't exist to support But if I see, we see data that we looked up, that supports it with, like, you know, the NIH, the, uh, in Europe, the European, European We're done. Diet. We're done. I'm sorry, I'm not going to get into that argument with you. That's not an argument. I'm not going to get into the argument. But why is it an argument? It's just talking about in European study of diabetes and other places that have studies, why... There are lots of studies. Why is it even an argument? There are lots of studies in the literature, many of which have never been replicated or, frankly, are wrong. That's why we do peer review, Okay. The European Association of...